I mean, these works have been done with Ronaja, Mike, Gunther, and, and, and Arvind. Um, I'm also going to be talking about some uh, work done in collaborations with experimentalists with the lab of uh, Erika Iser when she was at Cavendish, and, and also with the lab of uh, Professor Sachi Thutapalli at ICTS and, and CBS. All right, so, so this is the plan of the talk today. This talk is basically active particles in a fluid. So you, you, have, you, you imagine a tank of fluid or two parallel plates uh, containing fluid and some colloidal particles. So active particles are just special colloids. By colloids, I mean particles of the sizes a few microns. So, so that's active particle. And they have non-equilibrium processes on their surface. For example, you could have, you could have these uh, microorganisms which have little appendages on their body which stir the fluid and, and create fluid flow. You could have phonetic <laughs> particles where there is a chemical asymmetry and, and you put in, fluid, put in some fuel like hydrogen peroxide and that creates a gradient of, of, of concentration of the solid molecules on the surface. That leads to self-propulsion. Rahul explained very well yesterday about these active droplets. Now I, I have a concentration gradient of the surfactants that drives a flow on the surface and an active particle self-propels in a response to that, that flow. So basically active matter is, is a non-equilibrium system which is driven away from equilibrium at the level of each particle, and, and Prigogin coined the term dissipative structure to distinguish self-organization in non-equilibrium systems. For example, if you had a, a collection of hard spheres, then many of you would know that it, it will lead to crystallization by maximization of entropy, but no such principle will exist in, in active matter systems. Here structures are actually determined by production of entropy or by dissipation of uh, energy, right? So section one, some experiments on active matter systems. So we start with uh, Volvox, and uh, uh, Volvox are also very important in evolutionary biology. They were discovered by uh, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, who was the father of microbiology and also had made major contributions to microscopy, and, and he was just basically using it to see everything he could find, and he, he discovered uh, Volvoxes. They are multicellular algae, algae as, as in contrast to Chlamydomonas, which Rahul was talking about yesterday. So Chlamydomonas is, is, a, is a unicellular organism, so it, it, it switches between motility period and, and, and self-replication period. So sometimes it, 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 it moves and sometimes it, it reproduces. On the other hand, a Volvox has germ soma division of labor, so there are some cells on the surface which are called surface somatic cells. They are like Chlamydomonas, which have little flagella because of which it self propels, and, and then there are distinct cells because of which it reproduces. Inside of this, you see um, this spheroids. I'm sorry. So you see this spheroids inside of this. These are daughter colonies, and, and because of that, so this is a top view of the Volvox. These, these daughter colonies uh, kind of accumulate at the, at, at the bottom, so because of that, it keeps pointing up and swims up. So it's like, it's like a toy you might have used back in the day, that if you hit it, it comes back. So it always keeps pointing up. It's bottom heavy, so it swims up, and, and it swims up basically and, and goes to the top of the sample chamber, and then it forms this, this very interesting, what the authors called a waltzing state. So, the, so the, these two volvoxes come together, and, and, and they start spinning around each other, right? So, so the question is, how uh, general is this phenomena? So this is a green alga. Then another experiment on, on um, E. coli. So one thing I probably didn't mention, so Volvoxes are about 100 micrometer size, and they move about 100 micrometer per second. Here are some, some bacteria which are like four micrometer size, but they move at 600 micrometer per second very fast. They move very fast, so for them gravity is not important. And, and what they saw in these experiments is these bacteria go at the top and bottom and form these amazing crystals, like, like really, uh, I mean, as long as there is food, as long as they can dissipate energy, this, these structures exist. There is a crystal in the, in the system. And finally, uh, a synthetic systems. So here, uh, 
this is an experiment from the group of uh, Professor Eric Eiser. And, and here, what do they do is they use this, this very well known, which I'll not get into, biotin streptavidin chemistry to tether colloids to an oil water interface. So these colloids are free to move along the interface, but they can't detach. So they are like skaters. And, and, and one of the reasons to do this is you don't want to deform the interface so that, uh, or also not have any complicated uh, uh, interaction with the interface. And, and for mathematical modeling, you can think of these colloids are like connected to the interface by a spring so that they can skate around. And then what did it do is they, they heat one of the colloids. So this just put heating on one of the colloids and namely, you would expect from thermal Marangoni flow, as was discussed by Siram a little bit ago, that the flow will go away. But, but what this see is something very counterintuitive. So initially, there is a Brownian motion. As soon as the light is on, these colloids come together and, 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 and crystallize. And, and these interactions, this attraction, so to say, about the center of the heating spot is very long range. So it recruits particles from all over the surface, right? So this is, uh, this is uh, another example where you see this crystallization in a, in a very reversible way. And finally, the, the sec So there is only one particle which is active, which is doing thermophoresis. So for me, active means something, if there is something happening on the surface and a particle starts moving, so I just make one of the particle active, and all the other particles are like tracers. So, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's right. All right, so this is the second class of work which, uh, which actually is very similar to the previous experiments. So, so here we have an emulsion droplet, as Rahul described yesterday. And just like in previous case, where, 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 uh, where Erika and their group took a polystyrene sphere and attached to an oil water droplet, here what do they do, what Shashi and all have done is, they have taken lots of droplets and connected them by the same biotin streptivity in chemistry so that uh, these droplets can, I mean, they are, they are connected, but they can slide around each other. So these are freely jointed particles. Okay? So, so when there is a weak confinement, that is, you take a helisol cell, two parallel plates, and, and, and the distance between the cell is, is larger than the diameter of the particle, then, then it's very evident that this, this polymer is freely jointed. It, it does self-propel, but, but it keeps deforming as it goes around. All right. Now, what was done next by Manoj is he made the confinement very strong. So he confined this droplet very strong, and, 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 and these, uh, these freely jointed polymers became rigid, like rigidity appeared sp spontaneously and, 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 and we measured mean square displacements and so on, it remained ballistic in, in the experimental time scale. These droplets are active. So, so, so we are above, uh, I mean, I didn't go a lot into detail, we are above the CMC and so on. So if each of the particle will move in a, in, in. So, so, so this is the XY plane. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and this movie is seen from the XY plane. In the XY plane, confinement is along Z. And what are these, uh, so these are the fluid flows it, you are measuring in the, in the plane. Yeah, yeah. So, so they have some fancy way to do this. So I, I, I will come to that in a, in, in a minute. I, so I'll explain it. Uh, so so I, I just... What I wanted to do to start it was, yeah, talk about the So if, as you can see, it's very strong confinement. So height is equals to the diameter. So it's very strongly confined. As soon as you weaken the confinement, the rigidity is lost. Exactly, exactly. So in confinement is equals to the diameter of the drop. All right. Yeah, yeah, for X. Yeah, right. So section two, we are on to the section two, like how do we compute hydrodynamic interactions or, or chemical interaction for that matter for, for, for this kind of active particles. All right, so to paraphrase Einstein, what is the simple model which, which still captures the, 
the basic effects uh, while being something which, which we can uh, do some maths with. So, so here is a model for active particle. And again, I don't claim any novelty for it. It's been around for about 100 years. Uh, first studied by Helmholtz and Smolokowski in the context of electrophoresis. So you model each sphere as, 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 a, as, a, as, as a particle which has a slip. So apart from the usual no slip boundary condition, there is a slip on the surface of the sphere. So what do I mean by a slip? And uh, I'll, I'll get to that. So this is basically, if you like, the, the, the spherical cow model for active colloidal particles. So in, in the context of microorganism, the model of slip was first introduced by Lighthill in 1952. And then Blake extended that model, so to say, or fixed some of the calculations and applied it to locomotion of ciliates. So the idea is, because there is, there is some ciliary motion, I can expand the, the boundary velocity in, in, in a harmonics. And then from there, I can compute velocity of the particle and so on, exterior fluid flow. Then this example of thermophoresis, thermophoretic slip. So this is basically what was happening in the synthetic, uh, so the, in, in the experiment from the group of Erika Eiser. So you have a colloidal particle, and you apply a thermal gradient along the surface of the particle. So the particle will move in response to the thermal gradient. So this is called thermophoresis. If there is a, if there is a gradient of the solutes, for example, if the particle is asymmetric, so that the, 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 the concentration of solute is different along the different sides. So then it's a diffu diffusive slip. You could have, uh, like I said, uh, you could have uh, electrophoretic slip and so on. So in general, you could have any Laplace field which creates a concentration gradient on the surface of the particle. And, and this, is, uh, this is, is the thing with the active droplets. So you start with uh, emulsion droplet. And, and, and the surfactants which you put to stabilize the droplet, spontaneously it picks a certain direction that leads to a concentration gradient of the, of the surfactants on the, on the surface of the particle. So this is indeed the experimental system of this active polymer chains. And then it starts self-propelling in response to the Marangoni stress. Because force has to balance. So there's a Marangoni stress because there's a gradient of concentration I'm just basically rehashing what Rahul already told you yesterday. And, 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 and then the particle will move because it just, just force balance. That the Marangoni stress has to be balanced by a viscous stress. And, and viscous stress leads to self-propulsion. All right. So, so this is basically uh, the general idea of, of spheres with a slip can be used to describe active particles. So, so, so this is basically, I, I had a couple of slides mainly for students. And, and some of you probably already know. But the question I ask here is, if I have a human being, OK, LH of size LH, one meter, and I have a microorganism of size one micrometer, both are swimming in water. So you know the viscosity, 10 to the power minus 3. And, and then what is the coasting distance? So if they stop deforming their body, how long do they go? And, and, and to make things more uh, sort of uh, dimensionless, what is dH by LH and what is dM by LM? So I mean, all of us watch TV. So we know dH by LH is order 1, maybe 2. I mean, if you're very good, maybe 10 at most. What is dM by LM? So that's, that's the question uh, I, 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 want to, uh, I want you to think about for, for a little while. So in any fluid, like if an aeroplane is going in, in the sky, it, it, it feels a friction because of it has to push fluid out, out of the way. And that kind of friction is called inertial drag. That goes as rho L square V square. And if a particle is inside, inside of, say, if you have to push a little plastic sphere through a jar of honey, there is a viscous drag. That goes as eta times dimension of the length times the velocity. And the ratio of that is, is what is called the Reynolds number. So the ratio of the inertial drag to the viscous drag. And you can compute Reynolds number for a human being. It comes out to be of the order of 10 raised to the power 6. For a microorganism, 
of the size one micrometer moving at a speed of one micrometer per second comes out to be order of 10 to minus 6. And then we can do a very simple calculation. The, the distance traveled is v squared by the deacceleration. So the typical deacceleration for a human being is, 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 is determined by the inertial deacceleration. So dh by lh comes as the ratio of the density of the human beings to the density of the water. On the other hand, the dm by lm for the microorganism is, is proportional to the Reynolds number. So if the Reynolds number is very small, so the dimensionless coasting distance is 10 to the power minus 6. So basically, if a microorganism stops moving, it just stops, more or less. It only goes as far as the diameter of the hydrogen atom, if you like. So there is no inertia, and everything has to, has to happen from the force balance. So this, these are equations of motion, and, and, and the, uh, I want you to take a look at it very carefully. Yeah? Yeah, it's, 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 toxic and di it's toxic and dynamics, if you like. There is, there is no inertia at all, and all forces sum to zero. So the force is proportional to velocity in the Stokesian or the Aristotelian way of looking at things. If you apply a force, particle move. If you stop applying the force, particle stop moving. And you, you, you put, plug the Stokes, Stokes law for, uh, for a no-slip sphere back in the, in the Newton's equation, and you get that the velocity of the particle vi is proportional to the force you apply to it. So as soon as you stop applying the force, the particle stops. And, and so why does an active particle move? And, and, the, and because the boundary condition is different. So initially, for the no-slip sphere, the boundary condition has only no-slip boundary condition. And that's why force is equals to minus 6 pi eta v h. That's the hydrodynamic force. But if you add uh, an extra slip component, then the hydrodynamic force changes. And, uh, and, and to very quickly summarize the main questions is, if you have this, this slip boundary condition, then what are the forces? What are the basic in general, what is the expression for force per unitary on a sphere if I have a slip, a most general slip on the surface of a sphere? So that's the question we, we need to ask. And, and, and this slip, in, in several cases, is determined by the, by the chemical interaction. So how do you account for the chemical interactions and fluid flow and so on? Right. So this is the question which we, which we aim to ask. And, and, and to obtain the force per unitary we solve what is called the boundary integral equation. And many of you would identify more the boundary integral equation for the electrostatics. At the bottom, you have the electrostatic potential, uh, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is given in terms of the single layer of charge distribution and double layer of charge distribution. Using the same notation, the first term in the, in the fluid dynamics boundary integral is called single layer. The second term is called double layer. G and K are the Green's function stress tensor. F is what we are interested in, V is what we know. We know the boundary velocity, and, and, and the Green's function has to be chosen in such a way that, that the flow vanishes at any other boundary in the system, because these integrals are only at the surface of the particle. So we had a three-dimensional Stokes equation. We converted it to a two-dimensional equation on the surface of the spheres, uh, and, 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 and choose a Green's function which vanishes at every other boundary. And this is where the choice of the Green's function becomes, so choice of the shape becomes very handy. For spherical particles, you can solve these integrals exactly. And this is indeed what we have done. So we expand, for example, the boundary velocity in tensorial spherical harmonics, and VL sigmas are the, are the coefficients. So just like if you do a Fourier series expansion, what are the coefficients? So VL sigmas are the coefficients. And, and then uh, we diagonalize the linear system. Uh, I say it in line, but it was a lot of hard work for Gunter. And, and, and we obtain this generalized Stokes law in closed forms. So, so the L sigma equal to 1s, the first symmetric moment, and 2a is the, uh, sorry, the, 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 the anti-symmetric moment, the first anti-symmetric moment of the force per unit area, will give you the force and torque, which you know from Stokes law. And in general, we give it for infinite amounts of moments of the slip velocity or the boundary velocity. We can generalize it to many body. And, and here we obtain these this friction tensors in terms of the chosen Green's functions of, of, the, of the system, which satisfy the boundary condition, plug it back to the Newton's equation and obtain velocity and angular velocity. At the end of the day, if you want to look at an experiment, all you are interested in is what is the rigid body motion? How does the particle move? So without going into too much detail, if you also wanted to solve for the chemical problem, you had to 
solve the corresponding differential equation, connect it through the slip velocity, plug it back in Stokes equation, and then obtain forces and torques, and, and finally obtain the rigid body motion. If you only had, have a slip, for example, a microorganism, then you only solve this thing on the left. And this problem is structurally very similar to what, what, what was studied by Taylor and Melcher in, in electrohydrodynamic phenomena. But yeah, that's, that's about it, I want to say. So then position and the orientation of the particle can be obtained by this kinematic equations. And, and we have a, a fairly uh, well-documented uh, software engineering standard so follow, following <laughs> library on GitHub PyStokes, which I, which I recommend all the students to give a spin. And, and all it needs is you choose a slip, slip looking, at the, looking at the experimental data, and then you choose a Green's function. And after that, it just plug and play. All right. So coming back now to the, what are the mechanisms? So first experiments, if you heat one of the colloids, what is causing all other colloids to crystallize around it? So I have only basically, if you like, one active colloid, and all the others are passive. So what's going on? So let me give you a big summary of, of, of the experimental phenomena. T equal to zero, these particles are just doing Brownian motion. Then at about 2.7 seconds, you turn on the light, and then these this particles crystallize around the center where you, where you heated the particle by a laser. And, 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 and this, you, you turn off the light, and you come back to the Brownian motion, and you could do it as many times as you wanted. Right. So we consider, to model this system, we consider that the particles are connected by a spring to the surface, to the oil water surface, and, and consider that, that, that the surface is flat for, for regions that Green's function is very easy if the, if the, if the surface is flat for a fluid-fluid interface. And, and then we look at what's, what happens. So if, 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 the, if you turn on the light, then the particle wants to do thermophoresis into the interface. So it wants to swim into the interface, but it's connected by a spring to the interface. So the spring will apply a body force. And whenever there is a body force, again, we know from electrostatics, monopolar, multipole expansion, that if there is a monopole, that will be the most dominant term for the potential. In the same way for, for fluid dynamics, if there is a net body force, if there's a monopolar force, that will be the most dominant fluid flow in the system. And this is how the fluid flow looks like. A particle is trying to swim into the interface, but, but it, is, it has been stopped. So from Newton's equation, hydrodynamic force plus body force should sum to zero. And, and because the particle cannot swim, there is a hydrodynamic force because of activity, so there is a net body force on the particle, which, which drives the flow away from, from the center where you trap. So you trap a particle here, the flow has to go up, but the system has cylindrical symmetry, so the flow has to come in from all the sides and, and, and go up to ensure incompressibility. And you remember, all the, although only one particle is active, all the particles are tethered to the interface, so they can't leave the interface. So they just come together, and, and, and crystallize. And in a very interesting way, if we, if we consider that this interface is flat, we can write an exact expression for the hydrodynamic force. And it turns out you can write it in terms of, of a potential gradient, grid of a potential. So there is an effective equilibrium description for this problem. So the answer to the question I started out, what causes motion into the hot region, to the, in the region where I heated the particle? It's an attractive optofluidic potential. So it's just like I have turned on a potential where I hit it, and all the particles just go to the center, to, to the like center of the potential, attracting center of the potential. That depends on the viscosity ratio between the two fluid. If the viscosity ratio is zero, it's just one by r. So it does depend upon the viscosity ratio. Yeah. So, if, so if you assume like it's an oil water, so air water interface, then it's just like you turned on a Coulomb potential about the, about the center of the potential. So the same thing is also happening in, in, in the experiment with wall boxes. They try and go and swim upwards, and then the force acts downward. And, and this is indeed, they have also measured fluid flow in their experiment. So this is the, this is the XZ plane. You can see that the, all the daughter colonies are, are at the bottom, and the flow is going downwards, and it's coming in from both the direction. And this is the, 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 the fluid flow in the XY plane. You can see that uh, if I put a tracer particle there, it will just come, and, and they will form a dimer. And finally, this is the experiment with, with, uh, with uh, team edges. Here, the particles are running very fast. As soon as they go and hit the 
walls of the of the boundary uh, they create this fluid flow and 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 the fluid flow just attracts all the particles and and they are bound together so in summary whenever uh, you have a particle stalled at a boundary and trying to swim into the interface it will apply a net net body force away from the interface which will uh, which will uh, which will advect particles towards the center of the force and, and lead to crystallization if there is a mechanism to hold it there all right so finally the last part of the talk emergent rigidity so this is the this is the video i showed you earlier i have this active droplets which are active because uh, the system has lots of surfactants and 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 why does it remain so rigid is the is the question so so to understand this uh, we we developed a very simple bead spring model so we have this this colloidal particle connected by a by by a spring there is no rigidity and then we add chemical interactions alone between these particles and the chemical interaction is such that the particles want to go away from them and 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 why is that because as uh, as as was explained yesterday as these particles move they create a trail of filled micelles and and this is not good this is not useful for the active droplet to swim it wants pristine micelles so that is why any other particle will will be repelled away from from this active droplet so so we we model the interactions between these droplets as chemo if you like chemo repulsive interactions and and then we run our simulations so it's on the extreme left you see n is equal to 2 this particle just want to go as far away from possible but because they are connected by a spring they they remain bound but they point as far away as they can so for n equal to 2 after a certain time they reach a steady state where there is no motion for n equal to 3 propulsion keeps happening and and the speed depends on the curvature and and curvature indeed itself depends upon the number of monomers so if you have a infinitely long chain it will just keep moving all of them will keep moving and the speed will be highest and as you go on increasing the number of monomers in the chain the speed increases and the curvature decreases so this is the mean square displacement plot from the from experiment you can see for about 100 seconds the 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 displacements remain ballistic on the right you see uh, the msd from simulation for n equal to 2 uh, once the steady state is raised, reached there is no there is no dynamics but for any other uh, n for any other number of monomers in the chain the dynamics remains ballistic because the chain has become stiff all right so what happens if what is the stability of this configuration so in in the experiment yeah kavir tell me sorry velocity are increasing and saturating as a function of n so an infinitely long chain so because so from 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 this plot at least from this movie you can see everything is uh, else is same for the for the largest number of monomers n equal to 8 it goes the fastest so so from from this plot uh Yeah. Wait. So n is equal to one is the highest, but n equal to two is zero. So n. So the maximum velocity which you can get is n is equal to one. So n is equal to one is same as n equal to infinity. Right? That that that's it's, it's, it's yeah. That's that's the thing. So that's the normalized velocity. N equal to two zero. So n equal to one is like the maximum you can get ever. Mass as in. So, so there is no inertia, but 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 there is a drag. That's why I mean, it, it so, so th there is a drag. As you put more and more particle, there is a drag, and that is why a, a chain of ten particles can't move faster than a, just one particle by itself. But as you go on increasing the number of number of particles in n going to infinity limit, it will approach the n equal to one limit. So that's that's a good observation. So for n is equal to two, because only for n is equal to 2 you see a saturation because the particle just rotate away from each other and once they rotate away in simulation we don't put any noise or any sort of thing but in experiment obviously there are some experimental noise in in the expert what they see is they remain static and then they suddenly jump 
there is some chemical coming from somewhere which leads to a destabilization. Yeah, that will tell me. No, no, they are all identically prepared and so on. But, but one, once they are in the chain, so, so it's, it's a very good question. If you want to model their fluid flow, it so turns out that the slip of each of them is different depending on where they are. So, so that's, that's a good point. So, so yeah. So suppose in the experiment, obviously, experimental system is, is, is there, there will be lots of polymers which you can form. And a polymer can colloid with some other polymer and, and transiently form a S state. So a C state keeps self-propelling, as also has been seen in very nice work by Sunil. But, but if, if, if you form a S configuration, then what happens? Is it stable? So this is the experiment. You formed a S configuration by some collision. And then that rotates away and drifts into a C configuration and then remains static. So then the question is, do we also see that in simulation? So we, we initialize our system in the same way as the experiment. It does rotate. And, and then the, 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 the chemical repulsion between the particles is such that uh, we indeed evolve more or less like the experiment, as you can see for yourself. And then the system keeps evolving in the C configuration. right? So that's my last slide. So I told you about how to compute chemical and hydrodynamic interaction between active particles. And then in between, it was more about if a particle is trying to swim into an interface, and once it is stalled, there is a monopolar force acting on the particle, which drives the flow. The whole fluid flow is controlled by the monopolar fluid flow. And that will lead to crystallizations. And finally, rigidity in active polymers can emerge simply by chemical interactions due to the trail they create around them. So that is it. Thank you very much. Ajisha, uh, <clears throat> nice talk. So in the movies that you showed on these droplets, right, uh, the yeah. chain of droplets, uh, there are a lot of uh, bright spots around uh, the droplets, which I think is a trace, trace of particles. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So you mean, you mean, yeah. Oh, you, in, in, in the, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but, yeah. But, but there seem to be too many numbers. So would that affect the bulk viscosity? And would that have an effect on what you're seeing? Or, or it doesn't matter? I, 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 I don't think I have a very good answer to that. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can discuss that yeah, later. Yeah. How about the effect of branching? Yeah, so these are so all these are all linear polymers. Yeah, they they yeah. construct in such a way that they end up getting linear polymers. But once you have uh, branching and loops and so on, uh, I think there are some very interesting results which uh, which you which, already have that. Which from experiments we do. Yeah. But but yeah. I don't, yeah, so they, they have already explored that, yeah. So then a similar kind of, uh, you know, uh, velocity profile and other things you saw, sim similar thing with uh, branching as well? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, hi, really nice talk. Uh, just a question about the Green's function solutions that you showed. Those are, they, they obey superposition. So do they obey superposition? So but like, because you have to satisfy the boundary condition, uh, you have to invert this big, uh, in, the, in the two body approximation, they yeah. obey superposition. But, but, but uh, in a many body, if you want to compute three body interactions, they So you yeah. haven't done the three body, because here you've got single body, uh, so, so this, this, this one we did at the level of two body interactions. And most of the times, it's, it's, it's all right. Because it's already decaying very fast. Uh, the higher order terms uh, will, will be sub-leading. I see. Yeah, yeah. So qualitatively, they won't mean difference. But we should really invert. Uh, we should do it more carefully. Yashwin. Hi, uh, Rajesh. Very nice, uh, interesting talk. And uh, I'll have more questions to you uh, after this. Uh, just one quick uh, uh, conceptual question. In, in fluid mechanics, generally when we are dealing with viscous liquids, yeah. as you are, we often take the boundary conditions as no slip. Yes. Right, because Go we yeah, have yeah, yeah. competing effects yeah. between addition yeah. and cohesion. Yeah. And yeah. unless you have an ideal fluid, 
across a surface, you have a streamline that has zero ta uh, non-zero tangential velocity. Yeah. But this is always zero if you have a finite right. viscosity. So we we do have a no slip boundary condition. You are right. right. But this is this is again you can you can you can blame Derry again and all these people. What they say is there is a very thin layer on the surface of the particle, which is say one angstrom, and the particle is one micrometer. And I'm looking at the effect because of this whatever chemical field and 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 uh, microorganism. There is a cilia. So I'm effectively modeling that motion of solute or the cilia as a slip velocity. If you want to resolve the system at one angstrom level, then you should, or, or like, I mean, at the level of the surface, then you will have no slip boundary condition. So in that sense, it's an effective modeling. So you're modeling the system, there is an effective slip, rather than resolving that boundary layer. So you're not resolving the boundary layer around the surface of the particle. You're just saying, oh, I'll pretend that, that the boundary layer and, and, and the sphere is one object, and, and everything that is happening in the boundary layer becomes a slip velocity. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, you just want to look at the suspension length scale and not at the length scale of the surface of the particle. Okay. So it's an approximation. If, if the boundary layer is very large, this approximation will fail. And then you have to do it more carefully. So when you say large and small, uh, compared to the radius of the particle. Radius of the particle. So that's yeah. Yeah. the scale at which you. Yeah. Then you have to do a molecular dynamic simulation. Then you can't do a Stokesian dynamic simulation. Hi, Rajesh. So the, when you uh, start your simulations, the time it takes for you to get to a steady configuration, um, that depends on um, what parameters. So I would assume one is the size of these chains, the activity. Um, do you think by adjusting the size of the droplets themselves or by changing the activity you can get multi different steady state times as well so 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 and, and and also it depends upon the strength of the chemical interaction which which i can tune by uh, i mean in simulation if i increase this i mean that sets how how fast they rotate like what is the rotational time scale of this particle I see. they want to rotate back so and 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 uh, yeah so that's uh, in simulation we can do it by that also just the in, what, what sets the interaction scale? We have these parameters I didn't show you, mm. uh, chi and so on. In the experiment, I think, yeah, because you can, you can uh, yeah, in the experiment, uh, I, 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 I don't know yet, yeah. yeah thank you. Sir, yeah. uh, it was a nice talk. So one of the questions I have in this video is that if the p number of particles are made to be infinitely connected, and yeah. like if there are infinite uh, particles in this configuration, so would they retain this C configuration or would they, would they close down to form a circle? They won't close down unless you tie them because they want to stay as far as possible. You see, that's, that's the thing. I mean, these this particles want to stay as far as possible. So if I have infinitely many, the two ends will want to go to the two sides of the universe. So they will form a straight line. So we will be able to characterize them using some arc. We can find so we so this is still something which we are trying to do. Find trying to find the curvature as a function of number of particles and so on. So this is a calculation in progress. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, hi Rajas. I have. So 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 they are if you like they are th they are like kind of beaded. There is one thread running through all of them. So so they are connected by a spring. But the two ends particles are not connected. If you connect them, you, you form a loop. And then you could also, like you were saying, you can form branch structure and so on. But carefully in the experiment, they've only formed a linear assembly with the ends not connected. So these are about 25 micrometers diameter active droplets, uh, yeah, like oil, oil in water kind of droplets. But they, they remain very spherical. So that's why they are very useful in modeling. Yeah, so, so me, just to add, I think see this is a streptavid in biotin chemistry. Yeah. So what they do is, if you in introduce some of these molecules, right, uh, they can actually chemically bind. So that's how the, that's the link yeah, that they exactly. used. It, it, so, it's a, it's a so it's a very standard chemistry yeah, that people yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rajesh, just the follow up of that. Uh, when you look at this binding molecule, right, and and for n is equal to two, they are they are actually rotating, right? They they rotate away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then that point has to slip. Which one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it, it is it is actually very freely jointed. It it can it can move oh, around. So it's it's the way they, they they do it. It's truly freely jointed polymer. And 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 I think uh, you can you can maybe see that. I think that's a very 
uh, important point to notice is um, yeah, it's, it's somewhere towards the yeah yeah this is the one so so you can you, you can you can see very clearly that that they are really freely joined just going about each other they can they can really do anything it's just like uh, very flexible yeah. if if you yeah. compute the angle between them uh, it, it 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 can choose any angle i mean we have plot for that i can show it uh, it's a green plus moves around right the which green, one green plus yeah exactly exactly yeah that's what it does okay just one small question yeah. in the second uh, topic uh, is there a spin uh, motion or is just moving uh, the center of mass motion so 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 there is a coupling some sort of coupling so particles do rotate every once in a while like uh, you might have heard like there is some persistence they keep moving in one direction and then they rotate away so and 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 and, and also so is that what you mean by spin so they are rotating yeah i mean you have this slip condition so is it generating a spin or is it so in this case it's not generating a spin but in general there could be system for example wall box keeps spinning around okay. as it moves it spins and that is why the dimer it forms it goes around each other so so you can have what are called chiral lactic particles you can be spinning a particles as well I see. I see. and 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 like i mean this was uh, i think this was th this is a very interesting movie again uh, you see here uh, these particles are spinning very fast and that's when they crystallize and i didn't get into this like i'm saying they form crystals they go to the wall and they form crystal but what is stopping them to just turn away and go somewhere else and and it's actually the spinning so the spinning is giving it like a top like stability so any any fluctuation away from the wall gets counted back and and and, and they remain stable into the wall so either you can you can attach these particles to the to the boundary by by some biotin structure in chemistry or you can make them spin very fast or you can make them bottom heavy so that they don't point away so there are several ways you can do it uh, yeah so spinning is is very useful several times Exactly right. I mean, the faster it moves, the bigger the crystal gets, and and this is also people have seen in Janus particle experiments, and and all these people who try to model with ABPP never get it right, because with with those kind of systems, the faster it moves, smaller is the crystal size. But here you can see the faster it moves, bigger is the crystal, because stronger is the fluid flow it generates. So, uh, particle, yeah, Rajesh, nice talk. Uh, so. About this uh, system, so when a particle rotates, I mean, it, it will also give rise to that uh, rotlet field, right? I mean, yes. How does that decay, and then how does the field that you are so, talking so about? The, so the know? monopole will always be the most dominant field. Okay, that's so, the monopole. Yeah. So, so because then when it swims into the interface, it's stalled, and 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 the hydrodynamic force has to be balanced by the monopolar force. I mean, that's that's the Newton's law. Okay. So that is why once once it's stalled, it's the monopole, and and, and every other field will only lead to some some. I mean. subleading effects or or stabilization of the orientation so is it very well understood that the spinning motion gives rise to stability that's what we did in our paper back in the day yeah so we have done this you need to you need to spin beyond a certain speed or you should have a more than a certain bottom heaviness to get the stability so this is what we did in 2016 we have this uh, big nice phase diagram where we show that you need to have more than a certain strength to get the stability otherwise because there is nothing stopping this particles to just rotate away and, and and go back to the bulk rather than be stable in this big cluster okay. so i mean that's why the spinning is important okay yeah thanks thank you rajesh for a nice talk generated quite a bit of discussion thank you okay.